Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, around the Motor City, Mad Mouth. Glad to be joined by George Icorn back in the Midwest. Mo- Motor City, how you doing there, George? Hey, Scott, good to be with you. Happy holidays. Same to you. And Rick, glad to have you back again. You guys are making a great duo, and I know we'll definitely be seeing a lot more of you guys uh, over the course of 2021. So, so yeah. how, how are your holidays, Rick? Oh, it was great. You know, I love doing these shows too. Me and uh, George are becoming like Garrick and Ruth. I love it. <laughs> well, you know, they're becoming a good team. I make no bones about it. And there'll be a, lots of opportunities going into 21 to pair you guys up without a doubt. So I had you both on my team. I really am. If my voice isn't so perky tonight, well, it's pretty obvious that the subject matter that we're going to talk about reflects the unfortunate passings of a lot of people this year. So you know, well, I'm not going to say this is a completely somber broadcast. It's more of an opportunity to celebrate a lot of the folks that passed away in 2020. And I will tell you right now, 30 days ago on this date, my mom passed away in Birmingham, Michigan. Tomorrow is my birthday. It'll be the first one I don't have her. But, it, you know, we all know that we have to understand so, that we're here for a visit. So, Mom, I love you up in heaven. Going to miss you tomorrow like I always do. But. Uh, the part of this broadcast be dedicated to you. So, George. Yeah, thank you. And uh, same to uh, my wishes also to your mom. And of course, my late mother-in-law, Dolores. We lost her in February, actually before COVID broke out. And um, I know she's looking down on us right now, too. So uh, miss you uh, very much, Dolores. And uh, thinking about you, too, in this year of 2020, which uh, so many great people we've lost. Thanks. No you're welcome. Uh, glad glad to do it. So thankfully, Rick, we don't have to acknowledge anybody on your side at 2020, or at least if there is somebody I don't know about, but at least one of the three is clean on the personal part anyhow. But what we're going to do tonight, folks, we're going to go over a bunch of people in the sports world that passed away, and I'm going to break them down by sport, and then I'll list the names, and then we'll comment on a few at a time and go from there. So, you know, I'm wearing this Baseball Hall of Fame shirt. And I can tell you right now that when I ultimately bring Tim Mead on the broadcast, I know that things are going to be a little bit, uh, his attendance will be a little lighter because of some of the ones I'm about to mention. So we're going to lead it off, baseball jargon anyways, with Tom Seaver. Tom, ter- Tom Terrific. I, yeah. uh, what a great guy. Uh very personable, all American looks. I mean, he was just like at the top of his game, uh, New York Mets and, and other teams. But boy, oh boy, Tom Seaver, too young, way too young to pass. Right. Yeah, you know, uh, on the baseball network over the weekend, they were having a tribute to Tom Seaver. And I, I was watching uh, his uh, 300th win with the White Sox. And then they had the when he pitched his no hitter with the Reds. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't see Tom uh, uh, Seaver when he was with the Mets. I kind of saw him at the end of his career when he—I remember when he got his 300th win. But one of the greatest pitchers of all time, Tom Terrific. I mean, his name is so popular. I think Tom Brady tried to trademark Tom Terrific, and they said, "Nope, sorry, that's taken <laughs> by Tom Seaver." So not even Tom Brady can be re- recognized as Tom Terrific. It's always Tom Terrific will always be Tom Seaver. So he's a legend, and um, it's unfortunate what happened and, um, you know, way too young. And, um, but what a, what a, what a career, what a life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously we know that his Mets work certainly got him where he did winning the world series of the miracle Mets 69. A lot of people have to realize that this guy was successful in multiple stops, albeit he's known for what he did with the New York Mets. So let's go down the baseball list a little bit more than George and I and Rick. I know baseball is one of your favorite sports. Al Kalon was definitely a tough loss. I did meet him one time over in spring training. Very nice guy, but everybody in Motown realizes what an icon this guy is. Another legend, yeah. Uh, you know, youngest man to win the batting title. He was 20 years old. Um, Ty Cobb was the youngest, and I think he beat him by a couple months. Uh, 3,000 hits. Um, went, I mean, legendary, beloved. Uh, with the Tigers and uh, another legend, another guy that uh, will, will be missed. And unfortunately, I get the uh, opportunity to see him play live, but, you know, studying baseball and reading baseball. And I just thought, wow, this guy was 
one of the best, you know, his numbers going to the all-star games and just beloved by, uh, you know, in, in, in Detroit. So um, another uh, legend gone, unfortunately, in 2020. Yeah, played um, his entire career in Detroit and then went on to be a broadcaster. So there's a guy who's going to actually say that he played one place his entire career. Al Kaline's it, right, George? Yeah, yeah. And there's only about 40, 45,000 people that can say they were there on Al Kaline Day. I'll never forget when he and his wife, Louise, in an open uh, convertible uh, along the warning track, very slow ride. He was honored in 1970. And uh, that day was a big day. That was a very special day. American League President Joe Cronin was on hand, Governor Milliken, Mayor Gribbs. And uh, they honored Al Kaline, his wife, Louise. And that was before he even retired with Al Kaline Day. But just a great gentleman, uh, the heart and soul, just like Ernie Banks is with the Cubbies. Al Kaline what meant that much to the Tigers. I'm glad that we let off with baseball because the names that have come out of baseball are just unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I know it's it almost borders around, I hate to say it, depressing, but it really is when you think of the level and the magnitude of these names. So with that said, they make Fords in Detroit, but in uh, New York they have a guy by the name of Whitey Ford. So Whitey Ford, a great pitcher for the Yankees, Scott and Rick. Uh, just another just – gentleman of the game who was just beloved by a uh, Yankee Yankee kingdom. Um, uh, Rick, again, you and I and, and Scott were too young to see him pitch, but boy, there's great stories about what the, what he did to, uh, to help the Yankees produce the, those world championships left and right. Yep. Yep. T- total legend. Yankees, one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Unfortunately, I get the opportunity to see him. But, you know, when I was growing up, you know, reading about baseball, it's like reading about LK line and, you know, seeing what Tom, how Tom, what Tom Seaver was in his prime. And you see how they were in their prime and their numbers were phenomenal and fantastic. And, you know, and the uh, legends, there always will be legends. It's with the Yankees and you know, it's one of the greats. So, it's unfortunately, yeah. another legend that passed away for 2020. Yeah, there are more Yankees on this list that we're going to get to. But, yeah, Whitey Ford epitomized what it was like to go ahead and wear the pinstripes for sure. Well, let's go back to that 1968 World Series because Lou Brock and Bob Gibson played on that team. And those two guys, I think I met uh, Lou Brock or Bob Gibson out in Cincinnati a long time ago when I was uh, working with the Reds. But nevertheless, to, to lose two icons on that team, Lou Brock and Bob Gibson is just unbelievable. Like, like a highlight reel, Scott and Rick, um, you see that 68 World Series and we lost K-Line, we lost Lou Brock, the man was a phenomenal runner. Oh my gosh, the stolen bases he recorded. Lou Brock was the, like the, the, the engine that sparked uh, that offense for the Cardinals. And then of course, Bob Gibson, what can you say? Unbelievable statistics, 1968 and in uh, his career. Uh, just, just phenomenal. Those two fellows from uh, from St. Louis, and uh, and uh, it's still an unbelievable comeback by the Tigers to win that World Series uh, as they were down uh, three games to one and came back roaring to win it four games to three. But um, yeah, sad, sad day for Cardinal faithful with uh, Lou Brock and Bob Gibson uh, going just months apart uh, to their deaths. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lou Brock, one of the greatest stolen base uh, artists of all time. You know, Ricky Henderson broke his record. Um, you know, Bob Gibson, that magical year where he had that minuscule ERA, um, one of the most feared pitchers. And, uh, you know, St. Louis is a great baseball town, great fans, you know, and, um, man, just more legends have passed away this year that I can remember, and it's just unfortunate. And I didn't get the opportunity to see them play, but, of course, reading about them and seeing highlight reels, they were just phenomenal people on and off the field. Yep. Doesn't get any easier than this. Doesn't get any easier because now you can add Joe Morgan and Phil Necro to the list. We're going to do them two at a time. So uh, Un- Phil just died yesterday, didn't he? Yeah, and, and I think the Hall of Fame, uh, I saw a, a statement today issued by the Hall of Fame that they have never before lost this many Hall of Famers in a 12-month period. Like you said, Scott, baseball's been hit really, really hard. 
and those two guys you just mentioned, Phil Nico, the knuckleballer, and Joe Morgan. Gosh, was he a great guy. Not only a great ball player for Sparky Anderson and the Big Red Machine, but just a gentleman. As you know, guys, he covered Major League Baseball and, and uh, John Miller and Joe Morgan. I love that broadcast team, those two guys. Just it's it breaks my heart to see these guys go, and I agree with you. Baseball's been hit hard. Yep, you know, um, just you know, legends. You know, the Negro Brothers, the uh, knuckleball pitchers, both in the Hall of Fame, and you know, um, I used to watch baseball Sunday night baseball with him and John Miller, and I just remember his infectious laugh. <laughs> um, and you know, honestly, it's it's not the same without them. I used to watch it all the time, Sunday night baseball on ESPN. And I just love hearing them. And when they left, I kind of like just haven't watched it as much. And it's just it's not the same. They're just and I miss Joe Morgan a lot. I didn't see him play as a as a uh, with the Reds. I remember my brother-in-law saw him play and he said he always had a toothpick in his mouth one time when he bat. He had a toothpick. And so <laughs> he was part of the big red machine. And um, but I remember him uh, later on in his in his life when he became a uh a broadcaster and he was he was fantastic i love them and miss them to this day so it's just it's been really rough 2020 especially in baseball it's hard, it's hard to believe so many people passed away in 2020 yeah no doubt about well i mean you're referring to joe negro i don't know if he's in the hall of fame but he was a heck of a pitcher for a long time and relied on the knuckleball for sure i think espn has made a lot of mistakes over the last few years letting some great talent get away when you let John Miller and Joe Morgan get away, that to me is just bad. It really is. I mean, who have they had legitimately to replace those two Hall of Famers? You know, no. and you wonder no. what the ratings are taking a dive on Sunday Night Baseball. Why don't you just think about the talent you have on the air and how it can relate to generations. Look yourself in the mirror at ESPN and realize you had two icons. You should have gone out of your way to make it interesting. If icons like that die – you know, while they're during the year, I get it, but let them go as long as he can. We dealt with that at Ernie Harwell, George, that Ernie yeah. should have stayed there as long as he could. And those interruptions yeah. to me are just poor. We'll continue the uh, tour down memory lane with some of these other ones. We got Dick Allen and Jimmy Wynn, the toy cannon. Jimmy Wynn, recognizable for the Houston Astros, and Dick Allen was a heck of a player. At least yeah. he plays in the White Sox, right? Yes, exactly. And for a long time, they called him Richie Allen. But then he said, uh, call me Dick, don't call me Richie Allen. But uh, <laughs> controversial player, he bro broke through barriers, you know, the color barrier, uh, Dick Allen. I know he was, he, you know, he could be testy at times, but boy, oh boy, what a big stick he, he swung, Dick Allen. Uh, and, and of course, Jimmy Wynn, another great hitter from the Houston Astros. Yeah, you know, totally two legends, you know, and Dick Allen, yeah, he's known for his strong personality and, uh, you know, and he played in an era where, yeah, he did break the color, you know, very, where it was very rare to see African-Americans in baseball. And he, he came in there, he didn't open the door and walk in, he like literally like kicked the door in and here I am. And if you don't like me too bad, get get used to it. So, you know, he's just a strong personality, both great hitters and, uh, you know, again, you know, just 2020 has just been hit hard. You know, it's just um, I don't really remember all these deaths in baseball in, in one in one year at all. I remember usually a couple big names, but you look down, it's like, wow, it's just a, a laundry list of Hall of Famers that have passed away or should be Hall of Famers. Well, that laundry list is going to get a little deeper because when I throw Matt Kehoe and Bob Watson out there, Matt Kehoe was a key pitcher on Billy Martin's staff when he was the Oakland A's, when Billy Martin would take his, get his pitchers to go eight, nine innings a pop. And we all know about Bob Watson, who scored the millionth run, but also had a great career in administration, not only with the Astros, but Major League Baseball. He also played for the Yankees. So there's a couple more to digest. Yeah, yeah. I, and again, I agree with Rick. I mean, this list goes on and on. Uh, Keel was a good pitcher. Uh, again, he died too young. Bobby Watson, like you said, a good ball player and a good administrator, Scott. And uh, boy, oh boy, I tell you, it's uh, like you said, Rick. I mean, it's just unbelievable the way baseball's been hit this year with all these names. Oh, my goodness. And the list goes on and on, I'm sure. Yeah, 2020 has been like a catastrophic year. It's the worst year I've ever witnessed in my lifetime. And I know with this pandemic going on and you know, um, all these deaths going on, you know, and it's just, 
it goes on and on and on and just great players, legends. And um, it's just, um, I know it's, this list going to get longer, but it's just unfortunate what's, what's been going on. We're going through some more of them. So we'll go from Bob Watson and Matt Keogh down to Claudel Washington, an intricate part of the Oakland A's, John McNamara and Jim Fry. So we all know that Fry had a good career with the Kansas City Royals. John McNamara, part of the Cincinnati Reds and Claude L. Washington, mainly known for his contributions at the Oakland A's. Yeah, Claude yeah. L. Washington, again, a good ball player, uh, the great skills, a uh, great runner, um, you know, a, a base dealer. And, uh, and, and again, these are people that uh, it, uh, McNamara and Fry, good, solid managers, both of them over the years. They both had good teams that they managed. And, um, you know, they, they, their losses will be well, well, well known. Yeah, I remember Claude L. Washington, you know, when I used to, grew up in Los Angeles, I used to have Angels Baseball and Joe Torrey and uh, Ken Brett, George Brett's brother, would be the announcers and they would play the Yankees and I would always see Claude L. Washington and, you know, not an exciting player, but he was always an in- instrumental part of the Yankees and I remember him and uh, John McNamara when he was the uh, manager for the Red Sox, you know, in that 86 World Series and he was a great manager. He was just a very great manager. And, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking what happened to them in 86 when he lost the World Series. But, you know, I remember when, when he beat the Angels, when the Angels were one strike away. And, you know, so what, probably one of the greatest World Series I've ever seen was the 86 Mets Red Sox World Series. Just so many ups and downs. And, uh, you know, the I just remember the Red Sox that year. And, and he was just – he was a great manager. And I think he also coached the um, – Later in his career, he managed the Indians, you know, when the Indians were terrible and they played in that gargantuan ballpark where it had 80,000 people. So um, just more legends have lost. And, and it's sad because I've seen, I've seen a, a lot of these players I've seen in, the, in my childhood and they're just little by little going away. It's sad. Yeah, well, you talk about that ballpark, by the way, Rick. I've seen some games that are both baseball and football. And I'll never forget the time where a little pebble um, was the reason why Dave Steve lost his perfect game and no hitter. It was unbelievable. Municipal Stadium, yep, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was unreal. All right, we'll go on some other names I'm not quite as familiar with. And I don't know if you are, Rick, but we'll cover them no- nonetheless. Got Gene Budig, Harold Cousins, Rick Reed. Go ahead, George. Why don't you well, get an education yeah, on these guys? Yeah. You know, Gene Buttig, uh, the last American League president, uh, Gene did a terrific job leading the American League. And, you know, he had, you know, then then, then they brought the leagues together and then the presidency just didn't mean it was just an honorary title after that. In fact, Mrs. Autry, I think, was the last American League president that I, I know of. Um, the two umpires that died, both American League heritage guys, Daryl Cousins, uh, Rick Reed. Uh, Rick was from Michigan here. I'll never forget Rick Reed. They put Steve Javi into the Polish Sports Hall of Fame here in Troy, Michigan, and Rick Reed had to be there because Rick Reed was the godfather of Steve Javi, the <laughs> N- N- NBA official. So when Steve entered the Hall of Fame, uh, Rick and his wife were there, and uh, uh, Joey Crawford came into town, and Bennett Salvatore, and we we had a great old time with those guys talking and reminiscing that night. I'll never forget that. Rick was just a he was just a gentleman with a great heart, uh, an umpire that if you got to know him, you just really admired. So uh, I, I personally can say that that was a big loss for me and for my, my broadcast friend, Ron Cameron, who also knew Rick Reed really well. All right, we'll go on to a few other names here. You've sure. got, so from Rick Reed, Daryl Cousins, and Jim Boudet, we got Bill Bartholomew, David Glass. Uh, what's your recollections of them, George? Well, Bartholomew, of course, helped build that Atlanta Braves dynasty as their owner. I mean, he did a great job, and uh, and Bill was a part of that uh, that that team that saw that tremendous, uh, you know, manager Cox and those Hall of Fame pitchers. And Bartholomew, of course, they won one World Series, but they should have won a lot more down in Atlanta, as we know. It's kind of surprising they only had one World Championship, but Bill was the owner at that time. And then you also had David Glass on there as well. David Glass, yeah, former major league player. He had a decent career. Uh, another one, too, I know on your list is Hank Steinbrenner, of course, 
right. Hank Stoner, uh, Georgia's son. Uh, and you know, Scott, you covered the Yankees in spring training and all that. So uh, Hank Steinbrenner was not that old and he lost his life to, uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was cancer he had, but I know he had terminal illness. Hank Steinbrenner was also on, is on your list, I know. Yeah, when George Steinbrenner passed away, Hank Steinbrenner, you know, talked a great deal before he yielded the spotlight to his other brother, Hank Steinbrenner, and I rather, uh, well, we had Hank Steinbrenner, and I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, the other brother. Hal Stein, yeah, Hal Steinbrenner, and Hal yeah, Steinbrenner, Hal, good job. Right. Yeah. But, so, you know, I mean, all right, Rick, comment about Hank Steinbrenner. Well, you know, his, George, his brother and his, um, his father, of course, George Steinbrenner, and, uh, you know, he took over and, uh, you know, legendary Yankees. And um, like I said, you know, it's just unfortunate what happens to um, – he did die of an illness. I think it was cancer, I believe. And, uh, you know, um, just gone too soon. It's unfortunate. But, you know, legendary Yankees and took over for his father. So, um, like I said, the list just – goes on and on. Yeah, we'll mention a few more here. Tony Taylor, obviously, of the Tigers and the Philadelphia Phillies. Good second, complimentary second baseman. Ron Paranowski, George, some insights on those two guys. Uh, Tony the Tiger, I call them. The Tigers got Tony Taylor, uh, much like they got Carlos Guillen and other guys, you know, the second part of their career. And Tony was just a spark plug. I mean, he was really a good guy. Good guy to have around the front of the, um, uh, the locker room, I mean. And Tony Taylor was really good. He helped plug that second hole position for Detroit really well. Ron Paranowski, again, a good Polish guy. He's a member of the Polish American Sports Hall of Fame. Ron was a great pitcher. Los Angeles Dodgers, a good relief pitcher. Uh, they could count on him. Uh, Walter Alston was not afraid to call, you know, send out to the bullpen to get Ron Paranowski, trust me, to save a lot of those Dodger victories. All right, we'll go on to some more names here. You got Bob Miller, Glenn Beckert, Bobby Winkles. All right, George. A, a lot uh, of Bob, Bob Miller, you know, a lot of people don't know Bob Miller, uh, Rick and Scott, but Bob Miller was the head coach for years and years and years of baseball at the University of Detroit. Bob Miller was a whiz kid. Back in the 50s, they called them the whiz kids with the Philadelphia Phillies. And, uh, and, and this man lived into his 90s and just died this past uh, couple months ago. Uh, Bob Miller, great guy. Uh, Glenn Beckert, uh, oh my gosh, what a great second baseman for the Chicago Cubs. You know, Ron Santo and Glenn Beckert, just a terrific combination there. Uh, Bobby Winkles, again, a good coach, coached a lot in college baseball and then became an assistant coach, uh, I'm sorry, a coach for the California Angels or whatever they were called back there, Anaheim Angels, California Angels, uh, Bobby Winkle's uh, great career as a coach. Um, and again, like you said before, Scott and Rick, uh, we've just lost so many good guys. Well, I believe Winkle's went on to manage that team for a period of time, too. Yeah, yes, yeah, Scott, you're if right. Serves me correctly. All right, we, believe it or not, of this we only have three more baseball guys, and I'm sure Rick Curdy is probably glad we only have three left. In the <laughs> so we're going to go Jay Johnston, Tony Fernandez, and Walt Owens. Yeah. I re yeah. Uh, I remember Tony Fernandez, one of the great uh, second base members with the uh, Blue Jays and the oh. Padres. Remember he had that really uh, unique batting stance, sort of like the Rod Carew batting stance. Great switch hitter. Great fielder, um, just a really great uh, underrated player. And it's just when I heard he died, I'm like, Tony Fernandez, these are people I grew up watching. I used to watch him with, when he was with the Blue Jays and the Padres, you know. And, and um, it's just um, so, it's so sad. And Ron Paranowski as well. I remember he was a pitching coach for the Dodgers, you know, when I was yeah. growing up in Los Angeles and, you know, and, and you know, in the, late eighties and, and he was their pitching coach. And um, it's just, it's sad to see a lot of these people in my childhood. And, you know, I'm not really, I don't think I'm that old to see that they're, they passed away. So it's just so sad. Yeah. And then the last one on the list is Walt Owens, George. Yeah. Walt Owens, again, this is a personal favorite of mine. He was the baseball coach at Denby high school where I graduated from. But what I did not know about Walt Owens was he was in the Negro League. 
And he was um, not as famous, obviously, as Satchel Page, but Walt Owens was in the Negro League. And then after he left NB High School, became the head coach, very successful for a long, long time at Northern Michigan. I'm sorry, Northern Illinois, the the college at Northern Illinois, it's called. But Walt Owens, uh, again, a member of the Negro League. Okay. All right, let's go on to a different sport. I'm sure Rick is glad to get off of this one. (laughs) But we're going to talk about one George and I are all too familiar with, hockey. Tom Webster, I remember seeing him. With the Red Wings, those were back in the days when that team was considered the Dead Wings. And Eddie Johnson, uh, uh, Tommy was a pretty good player. He really was a good player. And Eddie uh, Johnson. Free Scott, uh, Tommy Webster, uh, you know, with Detroit and then New England. Uh, you know, I mean, he just, he he had a lot of tools, Tommy Webster did. He, you know, and he had some tough years there with injuries and stuff, but um you know, Eddie Johnson, another steady player, more older than Tommy Webster. But, um, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, these guys are, are guys that really we grew up watching, like you said, especially. Okay. Now, one that really is interesting, although he did live one good life, is Howie Meeker. Now, I know, Rick, you're probably out. Don't worry about commenting on this one. You weren't on our, uh, you weren't near our, our country, Canada. Well, our neighbor. <laughs> Country Canada, yes. So let's talk about how he meeker. Oh, I'm telling you, Scott, you you and I, Scott, knowing we're border city guys here from Motor City. Oh, my gosh. Howie Meeker, Hockey Night in Canada, just like Brian McFarlane and Bill Hewitt, Foster Hewitt, uh, Danny Danny Galvin, Dick Hodge, Dave Hodge, Dick Irvin. But Howie (laughs) Meeker, talk about a guy. Don Cherry, da- Howie Meeker. Oh my God, he got that squeaky voice. You remember he had that squeaky oh, voice, yeah. <laughs> but boy, he knew his hockey. Howie Meeker, like you said, Scott lived a long, full life, well into his nineties. God bless him. But boy, he was a great color analyst. I agree. Describing hockey night in Canada. Yeah, there's ever a guy that you savor. It's Howie Meeker. But I got to tell you, I did meet Dave Hodge many years ago out in Vancouver, Canada, for hockey night in Canada, and I remember, I believe, I saw the. Vancouver Canucks and the Edmonton Oilers there. It was pretty neat. So, gotta love my secondary country, Canada. Yes. Okay. I had to get that one in while my wife was looking at me like I'm nuts. All right. So, now here's a name we're really familiar with. George, how about Brian Glenn? Everybody will tell you right now that Dan Maloney gave him a headache. Tylenol wasn't going to get rid of. Oh, my God. And Dan Maloney with the Red Wings. So, yeah. Pretty interesting. situation how Dan Maloney roughed up playing Brian Kalani. Yeah, yeah. It was a big it was a big fight and very headline grabbing controversial hit. Um yeah, Brian Glennie, I tell you what, he he was a guy who wouldn't back down. I mean he talk about tough guys in the league. I mean Brian Glennie, I mean he wasn't gonna be your your 30 goal scorer kind of guy, but boy he was nitty gritty and he played the game with a lot of feistiness and yeah that that's a big Big, huge moment in his career, kind of a definer, like you said, with Maloney. Yeah, Dan Maloney, Rick, I'm going to tell you, he roughed a lot of people up. And I'm going to sit here and tell you, you, you're a big boxing guy, Rick. Dan Maloney was as good as it gets. And <laughs> he, he knew when to pick his fights, and when he picked them, he won, I'd say, the vast majority of them. Now let's go on to another high, hockey icon, Andre Richard. George? Let everybody know about Andre Richard. The way hope he lets it. Anyways, Andre Richard, a star player for the Montreal Canadiens. And I had a chance to watch him quite a bit. And you, you want to talk about how nice it was to have hockey night in Canada. Right by, so you had the Red Wings, the Maple Leafs. Let me tell you, Andre Richard is as good as it gets. You got Pat Stapleton. Eddie Shaq, Dale Howard, Chuck, Pierre LaCroix, Colby Gabe, uh, any of these ring a bell to you? Rick? Um, some of them do, you know. Um, I, I really wasn't into uh, watching hockey. I think I remember LaCroix, uh, so I vaguely remember him, but other ones I'm not really too familiar with. Yeah, well, I, I, I want to go ahead and talk about the career of Henri Richard because 
this guy here, uh, the, uh, Andre Richard and then Maurice Richard, two of the biggest dynamic hockey brothers out there. And I'm going to tell you, these guys were certainly icons for sure. We'll, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get George Eichhorn back in a moment and we'll give his opinions, but we'll go on to basketball and we'll talk about Tony okay. Bryant and David Stern. Yeah, Kobe, you know, I remember when that happened. Um, I mean, it was before COVID came. Um, I just remember getting a, seeing a thing on my fa on Facebook and I just thought, it's got to be a hoax. I'm like, Kobe Bryant, come on. Right. And all of a sudden I kept seeing it, New York Times, and I, I told my mom, you hear about Kobe Bryant? They said he died in a plane crash and it was all, it was all over. And my brother lives in Los Angeles, huge Laker fan. And he said it was just people were in shock, mourning. So sad to see him go. He died so young. His daughter died. You know, nine other people died as well. And it's just sad to go. And David Stern, one of the most controversial uh, commissioners ever. I mean, he was not afraid to speak his mind. Uh, I remember when I lived in Las Vegas and they'd ask him, you know, hey, do you ever think about getting the NBA team in Las Vegas? And he said, Las Vegas will never get, a, in, uh, will never get an NBA team over my dead body. I remember him saying that one time, you know, so, um, you know, he was just uh, been there a long, long time, legendary commissioner. Um, and uh, it's just an, another legend, you know, a, a legend in, uh, in, in, in sports, but um, just a very dynamic, very, uh, just a great commissioner. Whether he liked him or not, he spoke his mind and didn't really, and he, he never apologized. Well, I, I think of all the commissioners that I've ever seen, David Stern is by far and away number one. He rescued yeah. the NBA from financial issues there. He really did. You know, and when you talk about the the uh, mega contracts that he ended up negotiating, I think the problem I have with the NBA is I don't think the players of today appreciate everything that was done before them. And I think that when you measure David Stern and his legacy, load management wasn't something he spoke too kindly of. If you missed a nationally televised game, then you missed it. And I'm going to tell you right now, he, you know, Adam Silver to me is doing a decent job. But to me, I think that David Stern, the NBA misses him quite a bit. Kobe Bryant, I remember when I heard this news on social media. I say, like, what? Really? Yeah. Uh, same way. Play, uh, again, another classic situation where he played at one organization for his entire career. Mm -hmm. I know he snuffed the Charlotte by the Hornets at the time. Yeah, what could have been for the Hornets? Yep. Right. Can you imagine how that would have played out? Yeah, I remember. I remember Jerry West uh, got him. I remember Jerry West was against uh, high school players uh, going to the NBA and <laughs> he traded a high school player to go to the NBA. I remember that happening, but yeah. He's, and my mom goes, he was with the Hornets. I go, he got drafted by them, but that night he got traded to the Lakers, but he was originally drafted by the Hornets. What could have been, you know, you know, <laughs> what could, you know, history, you know, he went with the Lakers, won five championships and here, here the Hornets can't even barely make the playoffs. So, what could have been, but it is what it is. Great career, great person, you know, just uh, one of the greatest uh, basketball players that ever lived. And I agree with you with David Stern. He was Stern. Now, uh, Adam Silver, I like Adam Silver, but it's, uh, obviously the league, the right. players run the league. Um, if, you know, David Stern was alive, what James Harden is doing, he would have just oh, yeah. done away with it. He would have suspended him. He would have called him in his office and told him to knock this garbage off, stop being an idiot. And um, that's what I, I don't like about basketball. It's it's now the, the players run the league now. It's more like LeBron is like, the to me, the commissioner and does whatever he wants to do. And you have all these prima donnas now. When David Stern was there, no way you would never see that. You would never see Jordan acting like that or Patrick Ewing or Larry Bird or Magic Johnson. They weren't. He made he made sure no you're not going to be like that and that's what I miss about basketballs it was he like I said his name was perfect he was stern when he was the commissioner. Oh, I, there's no question. A lot of the stuff that's taking place in the NBA would never be tolerated under David Stern. That's yep. What, you know what? And I think part of the problem with the league is going to have is the more you see these lopsided games where you have to really have and have nots. 
then you really do have a little bit of a problem there. So, but, but yeah, I mean, Davis Turner was great. Kobe Bryant, what can you say? Sad, way sad. It just tells you how young. life really is. Yep, young. We'll, we'll continue the, uh, I, I will go back to a hockey reference real quick. Eddie Shack was considered the entertainer and he played a lot of his career for the Toronto Maple Leafs and every, whether, and back then when, and the, uh, for the Toronto Maple Leafs when you only had six teams. Eddie Shack was a guy that stood out. And I believe Pat Stapleton was the broadcaster for the Chicago Black Hawks, or, or I think he was the uh, defenseman, but I know there's, there's a Stapleton out that's synonymous with the Black Hawks. Uh, we'll continue back on basketball. You've got Curly Neal of the Harlem Globetrotters. What can you say about him? Legendary guy, you know, um, one of the uh, – when I was growing up, I remember him very, very well. I remember we used to go to the uh, forum, and we'd always – I remember my my dad taking me to, say, the Harlem Globetrotters, and they always played the team called the Warriors, you know, and they were – and my bro, my dad always say, don't ever boo them. It's just – it's 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 not real. It's like uh, – kind of like wrestling. It's just a show. Right. You know, it's – it's and uh, – they were amazing, the Globetrotters, what they did. They were like magicians with a ball. It's just um, amazing what they did. And he was, I remember him, Metal Lark Lemon, you know, those were the two famous ones uh, in my in my era of the Harlem Globetrotters. And um, just an amazing story uh, with the owner, what he did was, I think they were like from the streets of Harlem, formed the basketball team, and he traveled all around the world and um, just, you know, a legendary basketball player, entertainer, and uh, it's just sad. Like I said, I seen, I remember a lot of these players, seeing them, seeing them a lot, and uh, it's so sad that a lot of them have passed. Yeah, well, let's continue through the list. Uh, we talked about Curly Neal, uh, well, and when you talk about basketball, I know George wrote Mike Storm. I don't know a whole lot about him, but somebody that meant a little bit to him. But we'll uh, talk about Jerry Sloan. Everybody knows what he did with the Chicago Bulls. As a player, and then he can, and he actually coached them, and then proceeded to go to Utah. And he's legendary out in Utah for sure. Yeah, I remember him very well with the Utah Jazz. Took him to the finals. Fortunately, Michael Jordan got in the way. And uh, very underrated coach. He just, you know, was there for a long time. And um, it's sad. I think he passed away of Alzheimer's, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and so it's just, you know, I've had family members, and no family members have died of it. It's just a horrible horrible disease you know and it's just but he was a, a i just remember him as a coach and he was just a, a great coach me an underrated coach with the jazz and it's just i he should have won a championship you know he really did like carl malone and john stockton they deserved to win it have gotten a championship they came so close but those michael jordan bulls you know got in the way but a, a really great coach there's nothing wrong with being a runner up to michael jordan's bulls just so you know yeah i know <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll continue the NBA thing. Wes Unsell, a part of the Washington, uh, you know, at that time they were considered the Bullets with the Wizards. First championship he paired with Elvin Hayes. Uh, that team, uh, what a team that they really were. Dick Mott, I believe, was your head coach back then. and That was a fine team in Washington. Yeah, I remember Wes Unsell, great player. I remember, yeah, I remember when they were the Bullets. And then they changed it because it was like, I think they were doing like an anti-violence campaign and they just said, yeah, let's get rid of that name. And they became the wizards. But yeah, I remember him, you know, um, um, when I used to watch Laker basketball and they'd go down to Washington, he'd be the coach. And so um, it's just sad to see a lot of these uh, coaches, even, even though some of them I'm not familiar with, I do remember them. And it's just sad that they, they passed away, but they were just great great players uh and when they're in their prime they were like one of the best players so it's just unfortunate all right we got george icorn back on the broadcast george thank you for coming back uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to go over your hockey once and then we'll give you a, a say in the uh basketball or <laughs> you got pat stapleton eddie shack hale howard chuck pierre Lacroix, colby cave go ahead give us your insights on these guys well, Pat Stapleton, I loved him. Boy, what a tough son of a gun. The Detroit Red Wings, of course, were fierce rivals with the Chicago Blackhawks. And boy, Stapleton was right there, toe for toe, matching up with the Red Wings and, and really getting under the Red Wings' skin most of the time. 
what a great, great guy uh, Stapleton was for the Blackhawks. And then he went into coaching and stuff like that. Again, another shocker for me. I mean, just seems way too young to pass away. And I'm sorry to hear about that. But um, the other ones that you mentioned, of course, you know, they've all been really good players in the league. Uh, you know, Eddie Shack, you talk about a, uh, a stink, a stink steerer upper, as they say. Another word is used for stink. Uh, Eddie Shack, he was just so colorful. What a colorful hockey player, mostly for the Boston Bruins. Dale Halberchuk, what a great career he had, obviously. Um, and, um, I, you know, these guys, again, not as many. We weren't hit as hard with hockey as we were with baseball, of course. But And I know there's a lot of other hockey players, I'm sure, that are on the list. Um, the one young man, Colby Cave, so disastrous, obviously, to you, lose him in his early 20s. He just got married. And, uh, and, and he and his wife were so happy together. And then, of course, he died. Um, it was just so sad from the Edmonton Oilers this past year, Colby Cave. Pierre Lacroix, again, a guy that the Red Wings did not like because he helped build those Colorado Avalanche teams as an executive with the, uh, with the, with the Avalanche, Pierre Lacroix. And, uh, you know, all good guys. We lost a lot in hockey. Well, why don't you comment on Andre Richard? Henri Richard, yeah, I'm sorry about that, Scott and, and, and Rick. Henri Richard, a Montreal Canadian, the brother of, uh, of Maurice, uh, the Rocket Richard. Henri Richard, sometimes he get as much credit as, as his brother did. Of course, his brother had all those scoring records playing against guys like Gordie Howe. But boy, Henri Richard, he was the pocket rocket, they called him. He was a good player. Went on to have a fabulous career with the Montreal Canadiens. Got into coaching. And another one, Scott, like we talked about earlier, Hockey Night in Canada. Boy, you'd see those Richard brothers play or coach. And uh, in the case of Henri Richard, again, just a great French-Canadian hockey player. Just terrific Hall of Famer, Henri Richard. All right, now we'll dive into basketball. Kobe Bryant, David Stern, go ahead. Oh, Rick, what do you think? I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than that, does it? Uh, David Stern, you know, yeah. mold of the NBA and the superstars that played for him, under him, if you will, whatever. But obviously, you, there's no words can describe the loss of those two giants, Kobe Bryant. What a great, fabulous career. And, and of course, David Stern. Yeah, and like I was telling Scott, and I remember David Stern, just his name fits it all. He was Stern, spoke his mind. <laughs> You know, I think the thing, the problem with the NBA now, the players run the league. If David Stern was the commissioner, James Harden would not be, he wouldn't tolerate it. He would just suspend them. I don't care who you are. LeBron, yep. just too much drama, too much divas, you know, and I love, I think I love Adam Silver, but it's just, he's, it's a, it's out of control right now. And just these big personalities. And I mean, if David Stern was a commissioner, James Harden, he he would be like gone. He would be like, I don't care who you are. You're out of here. Yeah. You're you're a clown. And that's what I liked about him. Kept all these huge personalities in check, like Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Patrick Ewing. I mean, I mean, he's made basketball what it is, a billion dollar business. And and of course, Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest basketball players. Complete shock. I remember that was yeah. just the complete shock. It was shortly before COVID came and uh, when this happened, and um, I thought it was a hoax. And I just, yeah. all these yeah. people were commenting and, and it was when I saw it on the New York times and LA times that he died, it was like, Oh my gosh, 41 years old, his daughter died as well. She was 12. Then um, the other people that died on there as well. He was a baseball coach and the uh, whole family, whole family is, you know, he lost his mom. He lost his, his dad and he lost his sister. It's just awful. You know, it's just a tragedy what happened there. And, um, uh, it's 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 still a, it's a stunner. It's hard to believe Kobe Bryant's not with us anymore. Yeah, the only time I ever saw Curly Neal, the Globetrotters, play George was actually at Olympia Stadium on my birthday, and it was a pleasure to go to the Globetrotters games. And I had and Scott, I, I have to I have to tell you that I also saw him play. Uh, also, um, I don't know if it was at Olympia or at uh, Cobo Arena, but yeah, what a great Harlem Globetrotter, Curly Neal. Um, another one we lost, Mike Storen. Mike Storen uh, created and was the first commissioner of the American Basketball Association, the ABA. Um, you know, 
I know you got a lot more to go, but there's a, there's a, basketball was hit really, really hard this year too. Yeah, we'll continue on since we do have a lot more to go. Wes Unseld, Jerry Sloan. Unbelievable. Both of them great coaches, both great players. Wes Unseld with those Washington Bullet teams. Jerry Sloan, of course, Utah Jazz. And, of course, in his career, what a great player for the Chicago Bulls. Uh, two legends, two legends. These guys stood head and shoulders above so many other coaches and players. Um, and Rick, uh, you know, I know that, you know, they played probably before your time, but, uh, you know, they, 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 they became great coaches after they mm-hmm. hung up the cleats. Yeah, I remember Wes Unsell when he coached with the, with, yeah. with the Washington Bullets at the time. They were called the Washington Bullets. Yep. But I know he was a great basketball player in his time. I remember Jerry Sloan. I remember him as a coach of the Utah Jazz. And I'm like, what, to me, an underrated coach. And he was just a great coach. Went to two finals. Unfortunately, stopped by Michael Jordan, those pesky Bulls. You know, but it's just, you know, great, great coach. And I was always like, man, I wish he had won that just one championship, especially with Carl Malone and John Stockton. Came very, very close. But he had a, a great uh, career as a coach. And I remember those two as coaches. So it's it's just, like I said, it's... A lot of people I saw in my in my childhood, and it's just so sad that they have passed away. Well, Jerry Sloan, as I mentioned to Rick George, very intricate part of that Chicago Bulls team, went on to coach the team. And if there was anybody that knew what the word defense was, Jerry Sloan definitely. Oh, yeah. He was Tremendous. a nose ball player, and then he took what he learned in Chicago and became an icon out in Utah and did a marvelous job for the Jazz. So, All right, we'll, we'll go down the list a little bit more. We got... Eddie Sutton and Lou Olson. I did meet Lou Olson one time many years ago at University of Arizona. I didn't really talk to him a lot. But we know that he won a championship with Arizona. And, of course, he coached in the Big Ten. And we also know about Eddie Sutton. Did some good things in Kentucky before a scandal forced him out of there. But, nevertheless, they're in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Yeah, we've lost some great coaches in college basketball this year. And there's another big name that's going to come up. Next, I believe, for discussion. But boy, Eddie Sutton and, and Lute Olson were two of the finest coaches uh, in, in college basketball for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Lute Olson with their uh, uh, coach, Arizona. Uh, great coach, led, legendary coach. I remember Eddie Sutton as well. And uh, two iconic coaches, both in the Hall of Fame. And uh, it's hard to believe not only do we lose a lot of players in basketball and ba- and baseball and basketball, but also in college, how many of these legendary coaches we've lost, you know, um, it's just, it's sad, but those two, I, I remember very, very well and both great legendary coaches. Yeah. Lou Olson used to give me fits every time I picked him in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Notorious for some of his early exits. And the one time I don't pick him, he wins a whole darn thing. So, uh, yeah. Rest in peace, even though my brackets did anything but. All right, so, well, I'll tell you a guy that I saw in the 1982 Final Four, John Thompson of George, Georgetown. And we all know that John Thompson is the father of that Georgetown program. I remember seeing Patrick Ewing play for him. But John Thompson also had a good career with the Boston Celtics as well. John Thompson, what a great man. What a big stature man. Uh you know, he reminded me of a giant teddy bear, but boy, he was tough as nails. John Thompson was a great coach, and he became a very good analyst, too. He worked a lot of games uh, as a an color analyst. He did a lot of radio, uh, John Thompson did, uh, on Westwood One, calling NCAA games. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I just remember him as being a great coach. And uh, that Georgetown, of course, that was unbelievable, that team he carried. His team carried uh, all the way to uh, the championship. Yeah, lots of good players between Eric Sleepy Floyd, Allen Iverson, Patrick Ewing, and the list goes on. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I remember John Thompson very well. Alonzo Mourning as well, another great Georgetown Hoya. I remember he's a, always had that white towel around uh, you know, on his shoulder, and he was just menacing, big guy. And uh, I was like, man, I hate to get him mad if I was a player, you know, <laughs> intimidating, but just a, another legendary great coach. And, um, you know, great rivalry with him and Jim Beheim, and um, just a, a, a legendary coach. Yep. All right. Well, we'll stay with the Celtics situation while we're on it. You've got Casey Jones and Tommy Heinsohn. 
you know, everybody has to understand what Casey Jones means to basketball. And Tommy Heinsohn, a heck of a coach for the Celtics, but I couldn't stomach his biased demeanor, you know, on national TV. I don't care, Tommy, what you do when you're talking about the Celtics, but the way he acted on national TV, you know, rest in peace, Tommy, but you were forgettable on the national television. I mean, very forgettable. Yeah, well, you're entitled to your opinion, Scott, so that's that's fine. But uh, uh, Casey Jones, I got to tell you a little story here. When I was producer for the Ron Cameron Sports Talk Show, uh, we tried to get KC on the air and we tried to get KC to see if he'd be interested in the Detroit Pistons coaching vacancy. Um, Scotty Robertson just wasn't seeing it. And before uh, Jack McCloskey hired Chuck Daly, uh, Cameron and I were kind of campaigning for him to at least, you know, give KC Jones a look to come into Detroit and coach the Pistons. It never happened, unfortunately. And the rest is history. Chuck Daly went on to be a fantastic coach for the Pistons. But KC Jones, unbelievable career. He, I think he retired at age 34, won eight or nine championships with the Boston Celtics. Uh, Sam Jones was one of his teammates. And, of course, he played with the great Bob Cousy and Tommy Heinsohn was on that team. But just Celtic Nation has taken a real hit, a real hit with the loss of Tommy Heinsohn and KC Jones in 2020. Really tough, tough year for Boston Celtic fans. Right, Rick? Yeah, I remember Casey Jones and when he was uh, coaching the legendary Celtics, Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Danny Ainge. And uh, in the 80s, that great rivalry with the Lakers with Pat Riley. And uh, I remember when they would come to the L.A. and we hated, we hated, the, we hated the Celtics. You know, we hated Kevin McHale. We hated, but we respected them, but we just hated them because it was such a heated rivalry. But just a great, great coach. And yeah, he won a ton of championships with that Celtics thing with Bill Russell and, you know, just a great player, a great coach. And, you know, I heard he passed away. I'm like, God, another person in my childhood that I remember and um, just another legendary coach. And I remember Tommy Heinsohn. Yeah, he was kind of a controversial commentator, uh, an announcer, but another outstanding career, legendary career. And it's just so sad to see those two passed away. Yeah, I mean, with all due respect to Heinsohn, as I said, I, I don't like homers on national TV. I'm not going to say that his coaching ability, I have no problem with it. He was a great basketball person and knew what he ended up doing. And, you know, I respected his record speaks for itself. How do I debate that? But when you're trying to teach the game of basketball or educate your viewers, I actually think he didn't get it didn't get it done for me and back in the day when baseball basketball was good and teams hated each other that's when it was watchable okay now we have patty cake patty cake baker's man or yeah. go out there and go out to dinner after the game is over and that's what to me has turned me off about the nba all right george we have some local people that i know we'll mention but before we get to those local people let's talk about billy tubbs you talk about a coach there that made his name at the University of Oklahoma with that high up tempo style. Billy was a heck of a coach. <coughs> yeah, he sure was. I mean, Billy Tubbs, a very successful coach, another legend that we lost in 2020. And uh, like you mentioned, Scott, he had some great teams, Rick. I remember some of those teams and the NCAA playoffs, the, the tournament and uh, Billy Tubbs just had a fantastic coaching career, didn't he? Yep. Another great, another great coach, you know, and um, like I said, we lost so many this year and uh, yep, just the, the list goes on and on and on. It's just amazing. All these legendary hall of fame coaches that we, we lost with Casey Jones, Lute Ol I remember I, I forgot about Lute Olson. And like I said, it's been a long 2020. It seems like it's been on for five years. It seems like it's just, uh, <laughs> it's been horrific, you know, and, and yep. all these names that have passed away. I do not even remember so many legendary coaches, players that have passed away in every sport, you know, hockey, yeah. basketball, yeah. baseball, you know, there's another, also another hockey player. I don't know if anyone remembers Travis Roy. Um, he right. was the young man that was paralyzed. He passed away this year as well. I think he recently passed away. Um, I remember him very well. He was like one of these great, I think it was with Boston, Boston college, I think. Boston University, actually. Yeah. 
And I remember when he played and he hit his head and he ended up paralyzed and, you know, he was going to be this great, you know, hockey prodigy. And he unfortunately ended up paralyzed, but he did so much great work, you know, with paralysis and things like that. He just passed, I think he passed away I think like a month ago, maybe. And um, I just remember his story very well and uh, did a lot of great things with his life, you know, and was, he died very young, but um, it's just sad that, um, Never had the opportunity. What could have been? He could have been another uh, Wayne Gretzky. I'll, we'll never know. But he also passed away this year as well. Well, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, Travis Roy was definitely, I remember the story all too well. And once again, another life that went way too soon because of an unfortunate injury. All right, and we'll continue to stay on basketball a little bit. I'm glad you brought Travis Roy in. Thank you, Rick. That's, this broadcast is all about honoring these uh, great players and people that either they lived a long time or didn't quite live. That's just a story of life. But we'll see some Metro Detroit ones that George wants to talk about. Dave Smokey Gaines, Clifford Robinson, Terry Durod, and Nancy Darsh. George, why don't you give an overview on each and every one of those individuals? Well, Smokey Gaines, of course, had his – had big shoes to fill. He he succeeded Dick Vitale as the University of Detroit coach. And uh, Smokey did a terrific job. He wasn't there more than a few years, but he got them to the NCAA tournament, just like Dick Vitale had gotten U of D, University of Detroit, to the NCAA tournament. And one of those players was Terry Durod. Terry Durod played for Dick Vitale in Smokey Games and became a very successful NBA player as well. And uh, Terry Durod, uh, I remember the announcer uh, by the name of Tom Ryan in Detroit, the PA announcer for the uh, – the University of Detroit, with Terry Durod. <laughs> you know, he loved to do that. Clifford Robinson, of course, many teams he played for in the NBA. I mean, big guy, big guy, good rebounder, good, good, uh, good defensive player. Um, I don't know much about Nancy. I put her on the list because Nancy, of course, was uh, a WNBA player, but she was very successful coach too in women's college basketball. Um, she's not connected to Detroit at all, but uh, those four people, Clifford Robinson, again, Terry Durod, Smokey Gaines, uh, and uh, Nancy. Nancy, we remember them, too, this year. Yeah, I remember Clifford Robinson played for the Phoenix Suns, what he did, and then he yeah. ended up going to the Pistons. As for Terry Durod, he picked up a championship ring with the Boston Celtics. So, you know, I mean, at least he didn't go ringless, so more power to him. So, all right, let's continue on to football. If you thought these other lists are interesting, uh, we're definitely going to have an interesting list here. Everybody in the Midwest or the Hall of Fame knows Gale Sayers as big as they get, as you know, for not only what he did on the field, but that incredible movie with Brian Piccolo. I don't know. Gale Sayers is a big part of that Chicago Bears team back in the day. Yeah, Gale Sayers, again, just like Ernie Banks was Mr. Cub, Gale Sayers was Mr. Chicago Bears. Of course, Ernie Nevers and, and George Hallis and others were, were great players for Chicago or coaches, owners. But Gail Sayers, tremendous. Yeah, he befriended Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo died of cancer. The wonderful movie they made called Brian's Song. First, it was made on ABC as a movie of the week. Uh, I like that version better um, with James Caan acting the role of Brian Piccolo. But then they made it into a full-length movie, too. Hollywood did. Uh, but Gale Sayers, tremendous running back. Rick, he was a great running back. Yep. He had a very short career, but he still got in the Hall of Fame. That's how great he was. You know, and, um, you know, he he probably would have been greater if it wasn't for the injuries. But he, he was great. And I remember when he passed. I remember my, my mom texted me. She doesn't know nothing about sports, but she remembers Brian's song. He goes, yeah. that Gale Sayers passed away. And I said, yeah, I heard. And. You know, and yeah, he befriended uh, Brian Piccolo, who died of lung cancer at age 23. Um, James Conn played. Um, I like the old version. Uh, yeah. I'm, I like the classic version. Sad, you know, and um, just legendary Bears player, Hall of Famer, short career, but a spectacular short career. And um, he was just dynamic. Um, unfortunately, a little before my time. But, of course, you know, we got, you know, ESPN and yeah, Internet to see all his games, and he was just phenomenal. Well, it makes you wonder with modern medicine how much longer Gail Sayers' career could be and how many more records he would have. But, nevertheless, 
back at the time you didn't have it, but yeah, Gale Sayers, George and I can certainly identify with it because we saw him twice a, a year against the Detroit Lions. Wooly Wood, where was Green Bay Packer? My goodness. Yeah, Hall of Famer, Willie Wood, terrific player. Mon, mon, many of those guys that played under Vince Lombardi, of course, went into the Hall of Fame. And uh, I tell you what, uh, you know, Willie Wood is as good as they come. And what a great defender. Yeah. All right, Tom Dempsey is a guy we know all too well, right? Oh. <laughs> Tom Dempsey, oh my gosh, a 63-yard field goal, wasn't it, Scott? The New Orleans Saints playing at Old Tulane Stadium. Oh, defeated yeah. our Detroit Lions. And, uh, you know, his foot, he had half a foot. He had like a kicking shoe, that they special shoe that they let him wear. And he kicks this 63-yard field goal. I'll never forget Don Crickey was the announcer on that game. He goes, I don't believe it. He goes, I don't believe it. A 63-yard field goal, I don't believe it. Don't believe what I saw. Sort of like what Buck said, you know, in the World Series, but not quite. But Don Crickey called that game, and I'll never forget that. The, the Lions were just devastated to see this guy come out there and kick a 63-yard field goal to win the game. Uh, Tom Dempsey, great, great uh, kicking career with the New Orleans Saints. We had another infamous moment in Lions history. Lane <laughs> Stadium. I don't want to get into a long, elaborate conversation about Tom Dempsey when he nailed it with that square foot. I'm not surprised that Tom Dempsey could kick over in an arena football league with that thing being so narrow and square. Yeah. And, and yeah. About Tom Dempsey. Yeah, I, I remember that field goal, um, you know, all over. You know, it was one of those, like, he's going to kick a what? A 60 what? And, uh, yeah, he had, like, a, a half a foot. I remember – reading about it and, and like, like, I mean, he, he didn't even have a full foot and he still kicked it. And it was unfortunately devastating for the lions. And I, I, I don't think they've still, I don't think, I think they're still recovering from it to be quite <laughs> honest for you, with you. So um, yeah, uh, but I, I remember him. Uh, I mean, I didn't see him play, but very infamous, you know, thing at that time, it was a record and um, he was a great kicker and um, but he'll always be remembered for kicking that 63 yard field goal at, was you know there's no way he's gonna make it there's no way and he did well for whatever it's worth and this is about the best timing you can ever get for this okay but my birthday being on december 29th 1962 the last time the lions won the championship was on december 29th 1957 i wasn't born so if anybody ever wants to look at a date connected to something I can connect my birthday to the last Lions title, and it doesn't look like there's anyone in sight soon. So you talk about timing, that is timing. All right, so let's go on to Pete Dye and Willie Davis, George. Well, Pete Dye, phenomenal coaching career. I think he had 19 years coaching, a 7-2-1 and one bowl record. He won 153 games in those 19 years, won 70% of his games. Um, just a tremendous coach, uh, Auburn, uh, he put Auburn on the map. He was one of those classic coaches like Woody Hayes in Ohio state and Bo Schembechler in Michigan, Pat Dye with Auburn and Johnny majors with Texas. I mean, these guys, they made their careers off one school, one university for the most part. And, uh, and like I said, Pat Dye was a terrific coach at Auburn. I remember those games. A lot of those games, Keith Jackson used to call those games, remember, on ABC, mm -hmm. uh, Pat Dye's Auburn Tigers. Yeah. All right, well, let's continue to go through the list. Talk about Johnny Majors, won a national championship yeah. with the Pittsburgh Panthers, and then some pretty good sets on in Tennessee as well. Talk about a program changer, Johnny Majors is definitely. Yeah, another one, Scott, just like you mentioned. Yeah, terrific guy, terrific coach, Johnny Majors. All right, let's let's continue to accelerate through the list. Uh, Jim Kick, Don Shula. I actually met Jim Kick many years ago over yeah. at Yancey's, uh Sports Bar out in Boca Raton. Took a photo with him, and Don Shula I worked with. So, you know, you talk about two guys from the '72 Dolphins. Uh, they were as good as it gets. I mean, the Dolphins haven't won a Super Bowl since the uh, early '70s, but Jim Kick, Don Shula, as good as it gets. Uh, Rick, do you have any uh, recollections of either of those two? I, of course, I remember Don Shula very, very well, you know, uh, with the 
a little before my time when he was with the Colts, but I remember when he was with Miami, with Dan Marino, and uh, just a great coach, leg- legendary coach, um, just one of the greatest coaches of all time, you know, and um, it just, when I heard about his passing, I was just like, wow, another legendary Hall of Fame player or coach, manager, passes away in 2020. It's just unbelievable. So I, I remember Don Shula very, very, very well. And he was one of the best, one of the greatest. And uh, never met the man, unfortunately, but I heard a lot of nice things about him. And he was just a great guy uh, off the field as well. He's intimidating, I can tell you that. And the irony about Shula's death is, is that it occurred on the same day Ernie Harwell died, but 10 years earlier. So everybody knows where I stand with Ernie Harwell by now, if you, if you don't. And listen yeah. to some last broadcast. All right, we'll go through it a little bit more. You got Mike McCormick, Pepper Rogers, Fred Dean, and just most recently Kevin Green. All right, George, lead off with each and every one of those four that I know Again, we're talk about. These are, the these are guys that, yeah, they had great careers. Um, you know, Freddie Dean out in the Los Angeles area. Um, Kevin Green, a terrific career. Uh, Pepper Rogers, what a great coach he was. Mike McCormick, a very successful coach. I mean, the, the Eagles uh, for a long, long time. Um, and again, these guys that you mentioned are just, you know, some of them are different age spectrums, a little bit older. But, you know, Kevin Green just died the other day and he was uh, he was uh, he's a Hall of Famer, man. I mean, he was a great defender, Kevin Green. I remember seeing him play all those years for the Pittsburgh Steelers and uh, big guy with that big blonde flowing locks he had and uh and, and again dying way way too early he was born in what 62 so like 58 you know, when he died i think yeah yeah again he's uh, younger than i am for crying out loud but uh you know these guys a lot of them you mentioned are are, are great players and great coaches well when you talk about jim kick and now kevin Green, don't be surprised if there was so much head trauma that probably led to a lot of their si- situations where they pass away earlier a lot of times when you deal with yeah. trauma uh, nfl players may not get past 60 65 years of age and that's a good point scott a very good point a lot of these young guys that are dying uh yeah. you know, i'm sure it can be attributed to that uh, i'm not sure but i mean a lot of it could be well I've, I've spoken to a lot of nfl guys and when you start to die a little bit before your time you know what they've had to put themselves through in a league ultra physical is what you're talking about. Then their lifespan tends to go down a little bit further. I'm, I can, we could go over a bunch of names, but I won't, but these yeah. guys would be very big classic examples. I mean, well, they had junior say out for God's sakes. Yeah. I mean, there's a guy here who killed, killed himself because of all this, but we're not going to get into a lengthy, but I think each and every one of those, I mean, Kevin Green's my age. Now in 1962. So, all right, let's continue on to more football because there's a lot of them, but it's good. I mean, we have a great list. Sid Hartman, Sid Hartman worked for the Minneapolis Star Tribune, made it to 100 years of age. I met Sid Hartman or at the Pontiac Silverdome when he was, you know, again, we had the luxury of seeing the Minnesota Vikings, and I got to meet a lot of these out of town writers. So, yeah, yeah, good guy. Yeah, I'm sure Jerry Green probably knows him very well. Jerry Green's in his 90s now for the D- Detroit News. He's covered every Super Bowl. And uh, Sid Hartman certainly was a great, great writer, like you said, Scott. Yeah, so you got Paul Horning, another Green Bay Packer, Notre Dame guy. Yeah, Paul Horning, you know, he's a buddy, uh, you know, with Alex Karras, and they got involved in a little bit of that gambling thing. Pete Rozelle was, you talk about a hard-nosed commissioner, Rick Curdy. Pete Rosell was just like David Stern and he wouldn't put up with any crap. Now, finally, Alex Karras was, was supposed to be inducted in, in Canton this summer, but of course it's been postponed due to COVID, but Alex Karras finally gets his chance at the hall of fame. He was involved in that scandal for Paul Horning. I could never figure that out though, guys, they didn't hold it against Paul Horning his whole career. Like they held it against Alex Karras. God rest his soul. But Paul Horning now is, is gone, but, uh, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. But like you said, he played for those great Vince Lombardi teams at the Packer land. Yeah, I remember uh, hear, uh, hearing about that. And uh, I never saw Alex Karras play, but I do remember him when he became an actor and he was on Webster. Oh, know? yeah. <laughs> and that's what I remember him as. And I remember my dad said, yeah, he was like a, a football player, Alex Karras. And it was always like, really? He's an actor now? Wow, that's amazing. But yeah, and Paul Horning, a 
great legendary quarterback. And it's just, yeah, you're right. It's amazing that, you know, Paul Horning, you don't talk about that. You don't hear about that a lot. But, yeah, with Alice Karras, that's like what he was known for was how, how he gambled. And, uh, and uh, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just it's funny how it just uh, hurts other people's careers and yet someone else, it, it doesn't. Yeah. Now, let me give you my favorite Alice Karras story. I'm in grade school in Southfield, Michigan, and I get my football cards confiscated by my third grade teacher. I'll never forget. Her name was Miss Galicki. And I get them all back, and the one that she keeps is Alex Karras. Go figure. <laughs> well, missing one here. No, you got them all back. I'm thinking, all right, lady. Took Alex Karras, the best one of the group. So, anyway. Oh my God. All right, now. The guy that wore number 13 before Dan Marino has something in common with me. The name's Scott, but his is on the back end called Jake Scott. But he, anyway, Miami we'll Dolphins, see. but a great player for the Dolphins. Yep, absolutely. Jake Scott. Was he a safety or a corner? Yeah, he was a defender. I don't know yeah. exactly for sure. Yeah, Jake Scott, of course, played on that championship team, but a uh, great player, yeah. Intricate part of that team. All right, it's, Rick, any thoughts about Jake Scott? Um, I'm not really familiar with him, um, unfortunately. I do remember Kevin Green, though. I remember when he was with the Panthers. Right. Um, and I think he's, like, the third in all-time in sacks. Um, and uh, I think he was the oldest uh, player to win the Defensive Player of the Year. And he was also a fine wrestler. I remember him in WCW. We wrestled there. and um, But I remember him a lot with the, the Steelers. And, of course, with the Panthers. So um, it, I was blown away that he passed away so young. So um, it's, just, it's, it's just sad. You know, it's unfortunate. All right, let's go through this list a little bit more. we go to Jim Hannafin, Ray Perkins, Sam Weish. Yeah, coaches again, you know, all of them. You know, I think Hannafin was with the Cardinals. Perkins had like, some good years. Was it the Giants, I believe? Yeah, Giants. <laughs> Weish, Weish was, was Weish with Cleveland or Cincinnati or both? I believe Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. he went on broadcaster too. I know Sam Weish did. But again, you know, we're losing these coaches just like we talked about earlier with college basketball and the NBA. A lot of these coaches now we're losing, not only the players, but now we're losing a lot of the coaches. Uh, we're getting old guys, older. Yes. Oh, it's, We're it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. I'm I'm depressed. You know, I remember Sam Weish very well with the Bengals, and yeah, they came so close of winning that Super Bowl. You know, and of course Joe Montana, the magician uh, quarterback. You know, just I mean the guy just you know knew when how to win, it and it, it looked like uh, like oh here's the Bengals, and I remember Icky Woods and all that, and he was a great coach, and uh, they came so close to winning that Super Bowl, and um, unfortunately. 49ers came back, but I remember Sam Weish, very, very good head coach for the uh, uh, the Bengals. Yeah, Sam Weish was never shy about taking shots at Cleveland, that's for sure. Ray Perkins <laughs> ended up coaching for Alabama. The first thing he did was, I think it took a tower down that Bear Bryant used to use, and he tried to make his own identity there. But Ray Perkins, obviously, know for what he did with the Giants, and then he ended up succeeding Bear Bryant in Alabama. Let's keep this thing going a little bit. George Perlis, uh, obviously a big, intricate part of Michigan State, George. Well, yeah, but before that, don't forget he was with the Pittsburgh Steelers, so right. Chuck Noll. And uh, George Perlis was a great coach. He took the Michigan State Spartans to the Rose Bowl. Um, you know, he had some great talent playing for him. Uh, uh, just a great man, a great ambassador for Michigan State University. After his coaching career, in fact, he became a member of the board of trustees for the Michigan state and George Perlis was known what a defensive whiz he was with the Steelers uh, before, before taking over the job there. And of course you and I, Scott, you and I know that he and Ken Hoffman, uh, they're the ones that the glue that held together that college bowl, that postseason bowl game in Detroit, which started out as a cherry bowl. And then it became the motor city bowl and the quick lane bowl. Now it's called for a while. It was the little Caesars bowl, but, uh, George and, and Ken Hoffman, of course, ran that bowl game before the Detroit Lions took it over. Yeah, I remember meeting George Perlis when Michigan State took on USC at the Sun Bowl in El Paso and spent time with him. Really a nice guy for sure. And Ken Hoffman, yeah. obviously, been a big help too. Yeah. 
All right, let's continue on. Woody Weidenhofer, John Tierlink. I know that John Tierlink was a pass rusher as galore in terms of when it came to, you know, you know emphasizing. So I want you to give everybody an overview of those guys, George. Well, again, these were assistant coaches. I know they had, to, you know, some time with the Detroit Lions, Woody Woodenhofer, John Turling, Joe Bugles, another one. Uh, these guys were very good uh, at their job, which was being an assistant coach or in a coordinator position. Um, I, I thought that they both, uh, all three of them did very, very well at their stops here in Detroit, especially. Rick, I don't know if you have any recollections on any of these guys, but as you notice, we're losing a lot of our, now we're starting to lose a lot of the assistant coaches too in the NFL. Yeah, I know. Unfortunately, you know, they're a little, probably a little before my time. I'm not really familiar with them, but it's just, uh, amazing how many coaches assistant coaches that have passed away this year it's just like I said this 2020 feels like uh five years instead of one it's just um I just can't even remember so many sports people dying or or even like the actors there's a whole list of actors that have died as well that are (laughs) just like unbelievable but I mean I remember with with Don Shula it's like it feels like he died a long time ago but it's it's been such a long year. It feels like it, but he did die this year. So it's just, um, like I said, you know, it's just sad to see all these uh, coaches and uh, players passing away. Yeah, Joe Bugle went on to coach the Arizona Cardinals and was an intricate part of building that offensive line with the Washington football team, as they're now called, with the Hawks. I remember him. Yeah, I so- remember when he went to the Raiders. Yeah, he was he, also the, head, the coach with the Raiders as well. So, yeah, I'm very, but he was the coach for the uh, Cardinals for a very, very long time. All right, as we continue through the list, got Frank Maloney and Jim Lambright. George, we're going to let you just give an overview of these guys, and I'll have you start to give an overview as to why you thought they belong on this list. Well, Frank Maloney was a great coach with the uh, Syracuse, uh, the Orange. Uh, Frank Maloney had a great career. Hall of Fame career coaching them. He was, he only got the one bowl game, believe it or not, which is kind of ironic. But uh, Frank Maloney was a really great coach for, for Syracuse, like I said, for so many years. Um, Lambright, uh, University of Washington. You know, um, he he guided the University of Washington uh, to some great career, uh, great uh, games and great bowl games. Uh, he was only one and three in the bowls, but uh, a lot of players looked up to him. The University of Washington players and colleagues were really in a state of shock, and they really had a lot of tributes to him. Again, Jim Lambright uh, from the University of Washington. I got Tommy Vaughn, Bill Yeoman. Well, Tommy Vaughn, of course, one of your, uh, uh, you know, one of your frequent guests on your show is Mel Farr Jr. And of course, Mel Farr Sr. was very good friends with Tommy Vaughn. And in fact, Scott, on the program that we had Mel talking, uh, he remembered that, uh, you know, his dad really was close friends with Tommy Vaughn, a good defensive back for the Detroit Lions in the early 60s, played with Mel Farr, Joe Schmidt, guys like that. Uh, um, Dick Duran was on that team. I, I don't know if I don't know if Vaughn played with Dick Knight, Train Lane, possibly. But again, the Lions had a great defense and a great secondary as well. Tommy Vaughn was part of that. And uh like I said, especially here in Detroit, we're going to miss him uh, very, very much. Uh, yeah. Bill, Yeoman, Bill Yeoman, a great coach in college, just tremendous coach. I remember that. I believe he was with the Houston Cougars, if I remember correctly. Yes, you're right, Scott. Okay, another local guy in Metro Detroit we can talk about, Herb Orvis. Herb Orvis, a big, defend, a big defender. <laughs> you know, Herb Orvis was a big guy. He was tremendous talent. Well, a very high draft choice by the Lions, too. And uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, again, taken too, too early in his life. Um, Herb Orvis played for the Lions for a number of years. And uh, I liked him. I mean, you know, he was part of that offensive line, that big offensive line they had. And, uh, you know, Greg Landry was under, you know, under center as the quarterback for a long time with Herb Orvis leading the way. And uh, I'm going to miss him, too. Another guy named Herb. Herb Adderley is on our list, Scott and Rick. And Herb Adderley, fantastic career, member of the College Football Hall of Fame, great defender again, Michigan State University, one of the all-time great Spartans. Uh, George Blaha, their play-by-play announcer, will let you know that, that Herb Adderley was just a terrific, uh, just a terrific, terrific football player for for the Spartans. Yeah, I remember Herb Orvis quite well, that's for sure. And 
fine player for sure. All right, let's move along here. Ken, Ry uh, Ken Riley and then Michael McCaskey. I believe Matt Michael McCaskey is with the Bears, isn't he? That's true. Yeah. In fact, his, uh, is it his, his wife still runs the team, I believe. Uh, Mrs. McCaskey. Uh, Ken Riley was a defensive back. He had a good career, uh, very good career playing, and, and it was a cornerback. Uh, and uh, um, again, you know, he, he left us too early. You know, he played in the 60s, I think the 60s and the 70s for the Cincinnati Bengals for the most part of his career. Ken Riley was a good player. Um, McCaskill, of course, I mean, you know, you talk about <laughs> filling big shoes of George Hallis, but, uh, you know, McCaskill and his family took over the Bears and, uh, you know, they had some great careers, obviously, the, you know, Mike Ditka is their coach and, uh, you know, Dick, Dick Butkus is one of their players and uh, the McCaskies, uh, you know, had, had some good years, but obviously they've had a lot of lean years lately too as well with, uh, with his widow uh, running the team now. Yeah, so all right, so we go on from Michael McCaskey, you got Mike Curtis, and I think one that I'm really surprised at as I look at this is Tavares Jackson. All right, so yeah, a Jackson was the quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very young. I'm um, not sure what he died from, but he we lost him this year. Uh, Mike Curtis was a great ball player, I remember, in uh, college and in high school. I'm sorry, college, yeah, high school too, I'm sure, but with the Baltimore Colts mostly that I remember Mike Curtis. Uh, I think he played for Washington too in Seattle as well. And, uh, you know, Mike Curtis had, uh, I believe 14 years in the NFL, but yeah, Tavarius Jackson. I mean, he wasn't that old. He was, in the, he was like in his thirties, he died in a car accident. Um, and uh, he was like in his, yeah, he was like in his thirties. And yeah. I remember he was the quarterback with uh, Seattle. And uh, that was another, shocking death you know i remember him uh I, I do remember him and um just gone way too soon but i think yeah he was like in his mid-30s when he passed away he was very very young all right we'll go through the rest of this list that we have you go from Tavares jackson you got pete retzloff bobby mitchell go ahead george well pete retzloff i mean you know we talk about uh pete Maravich being called pistol pete but the original pistol pete believe it or not was pete retzloff um, he died in April, um, and uh, he was a great, great uh, Notre Dame guy. And, and with the Eagles, he had a great career with the, um, with the Philadelphia Eagles, Pete Retzloff. The Eagles uh, really uh, mourned the loss of him when that, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. He's a Hall of Fame tight end. 1960 NFL champion, Pete Retzloff. Bobby Mitchell. Uh, Bobby Mitchell, Bobby Mitchell. Yeah. I mean, he had a so-so career. I mean, he bounced around to a few teams, but um, I put him on the list because a lot of people remember him when, when he played in the league, he, he, uh, you know, again, and you talk about another guy that broke the color barrier, you know, and, and was, uh, you know, in African-American descent halfback for the Cleveland Browns for a long time, Bobby Mitchell, rest in peace. Right. Mike Stratton, Benny Malone. Uh, Mike Stratton and Benny Malone. Yeah. The, uh, I know that Benny Malone was, uh, <laughs> you know, some of these guys, I, I put them on the list, but I got to really, you know, think hard. But again, Benny Malone was, uh, was a guy in the NFL played for the dolphins. He was drafted in 1974, uh, in the second round by the dolphins. And, uh, uh, you know, he played for them for a number of years. He played for Don Shula down in, in down in Miami. And uh, Benny Malone, again, he was only, well, you know, 68 when he died. I mean, God help him. I mean, another, like you said, Scott, another football player dying at a younger age, 68. Uh, you, know, it, you know, he had a good, decent rushing career in the NFL. The other gentleman I'm not too familiar with. I know I put him on my list, but I, I, I'd have to look him up. I'm, I, I'm not familiar I'm with him. We'll move along here. Chris Dolman, I remember him all to old Minnesota Vikings. Oh, I'm yeah. Fred Akers who I believe coached at the University of Texas. So he, those are two guys that I'm glad are on this list. Go ahead, George. Go ahead with you, these guys. Well, again, Akers was another guy, just like we talked about earlier. Some of these guys had fantastic careers, you know, in coaching. Uh, you know, in, in, in Dolman, of course, was a great NFL player. Fred Akers, again, Texas boy, you know, he had a lot of good years there. Okay. All right, let's talk about golf. I think we only have five on this list, so we should whip through this one pretty well. 
Bobby Jones. So they don't get a whole lot bigger than him. No, they sure don't. Bobby Jones, gosh, he, his name is synonymous with great golfers of the of of uh, and 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 you know architects of of golf courses as well. After he retired as a player, but Bobby Jones was a great one. And four other names worth talking about: Doug Sanders, Pete Dye. Pettis, Alice, and Mickey Wright. George Lynch. Is yeah, I'm just sorry for the misprint. I'm sorry for the misprint, Scott. That's Peter Alice. That's Peter right. Alice was one of the great commentators. Gosh, I remember him working with Jim McKay and Henry Longhurst. And uh, at Peter Alice on ABC did a terrific job. Of course, Dave Marr, the late Dave Marr, late Jim McKay. Uh, ABC with Bill Fleming. And don't forget our friend Dave Diles and uh, uh, Chris Schenkel. They had a great golf team. I remember announcing team at Peter Alice they borrowed from the BBC and uh, he became a great color commentator for golf Doug Sanders very colorful player Doug Sanders played I mean he was great guy you know he golfed with guys like Trevino and Nicholas and Gary Player Um, Pete Dye what a great architect so many golf courses Pete Pete Dye uh, um, uh, designed and of course Mickey Wright what a great woman she was a great ambassador one of the best women uh, golfers of all time, Mickey Wright. So uh, we only lost, like you said, Scott and, and Rick, about five golfers, uh, big names, I mean. But, uh, of course, the, they were big in, in their sports. All right, on the motor sports, let's talk about John Andretti. There's a guy, in my opinion, who uh, epitomizes what a driver is. He definitely is. John Andretti would go ahead and race in the Indianapolis 500 as well as the Coast 600, he raced on anything that he can. And I know during his funeral that he, he was able to, they went ahead and took his limo and he drove around the Indy 5 Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So John Andretti, to me, was just tremendous. And Rick, uh, you know this as well as Scott, uh, what a great name. Of course, the Andrettis have been yeah. involved in racing for so long. And, uh, and John kind of... Uh, you know, under the radar a little bit, you know, not as flashy, obviously, as Mario and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, you know, and John Andretti, though, like you said, Scott, boy, that guy, he just got his, got his fingernails dirty. He wasn't afraid to get involved in all kinds of auto racing. Right, Rick? Yep, definitely. I mean, the Andrettis are like the are synonymous, like the Mannings of football, just a yeah. legendary family. I remember Mario Andretti and I remember John Andretti and, like I said, I wasn't the biggest uh, fa- biggest uh, NASCAR fan, but, I mean, the Andrettis are just super popular, super famous, and uh, another uh, legend legend passed away. Three more drivers, Sterling Moss, Maurice Petty, Bob Lazier. Yeah, Bob Lazier, of course, was Rookie of the Year at the Indy 500, Scott and Rick, and uh, uh, Maurice Petty, again, coming from that famous Kyle Petty family. Richard Petty's brother, Maurice, and uh, Sterling Moss, Formula One driver. And what a tremendous career he had. Not as good as Nicky Lauda, but uh, uh, Sterling Moss had a great career as an F1 driver and owner. And uh, those are some pretty pretty big names in most of us we lost this year. Not a, long, not a long list, but important, guys. Now, I know a sport that Rick likes to talk about. I'm glad we're going to get around to it. Boxing, Dwight Davison, Hedgeman Lewis, Leo Sugar, Carmen Williamson, and Roger Mayweather. Hey. Yep, Roger, Roger Mayweather, the, his son, uh, Floyd Mayweather. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, just uh, legends. And uh, like I said, just a lot, so many we've lost this year from uh, – from sports you know so it's just um yeah and a couple of those rick and scott were detroit guys okay but i i mentioned them because as you guys know cronk boxing with the late emmanuel stewart it was just a tremendous tremendous program dwight davison came out of that hedgeman lewis came out of that and um you know it's sad when i see these young guys go because uh and, and again roger Whit- mayweather too was also from michigan of course floyd's uh uh, like you said, his brother, and uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, it's it's tough. But but just like in football, we lose a lot of boxers at early ages because of those head closed head and open, you know, those injuries. And of course, the sad case of Muhammad Ali and what he had to go through painfully all those years right. with you know his disease. All right, and last but not least, you had some others, so I'll go ahead and mention them and all those yeah, comment on them. Sure. All sure. right, there we go. Ready? 
Kurt Thomas, gymnast. Rick Curdy. What was it again? I'm sorry. Kurt Thomas, the gymnast. Uh, I'm not really f- familiar United, with him. United States male gymnast. Oh, he was great. He was in a couple of the Olympics and uh, p- competed at a very high level. I was shocked. I was shocked. Beautiful wife, beautiful family. Um, Kurt Thomas couldn't have been more than 50. I mean, it's just, I, I, he had some sort of disease, I guess, but I don't know what it was, but I was shocked. All right, let's go on to Diego, Diego Maradona soccer, a world white icon. All right, Rick, you're nodding your head. Go for it. Yeah, uh, legendary uh, soccer or football player, Argentina, you know, won World Cups, regarded as one of the greatest uh, soccer players that ever lived, great scorer. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people remember him, synonymous with a lot of issues with drugs. Um uh, but uh, nonetheless, he was a great soccer player. He's a legend. You know, yes. he's just a total legend. And, um, you know, it's just when I heard that he passed away, I was just, like I said, someone in my childhood, you know, I was a little bit before my time, but I do remember him very well. And he's just a legendary soccer player, beloved. Yeah, no no question that uh, the soccer community mm-hmm. throughout Europe and Argentina and Throughout the world, we'll definitely miss Diego Maradona. All right, let's stay on to soccer. Uh, Peter Whittingham. Yeah, he played for the Elite League in, uh, you know, in England, Whittingham. He was both a player and a manager, and uh, he, was a, he was very, very well known in, in England and uh, the Premier League that uh, you see teams like Manchester United and, and Liverpool and and, and Nottingham and teams like that. So, um, yeah, winning him. Uh, Rafer Johnson, another one we lost this year, Scott. Of course, 1960 Olympic gold medalist, Rafer Johnson from uh, Southern California. He was terrific. Just a, just a great, became a film actor. Um, the decathlon, uh, Rafer Johnson was just an unbelievable athlete for the United States in the Olympics. Yeah, one that you put on this list, which is interesting, my sister-in-law, Maria and my brother-in-law, Todd, mentioned her as Jeannie Morris, a sports broadcaster. I believe she was the first woman that covered a Super Bowl in, what, 1975? Yeah, Jeannie Morris, of course, uh, from Chicago area, correct. And uh, she was a terrific reporter long before uh, uh, it became popular to have females, uh, you know, covering the, especially the NFL and sideline reporting. And, uh, and of course, Scott, another one we lost this year is you and Rick No, Phyllis George. Oh my gosh! Remember that Brent Musburger, Phyllis George, yep. Jimmy the Jimmy the Greek, Snyder, and Irv Cross. Oh my gosh! To, to me, that was Sunday. That was Sunday football pregame for me. Yeah, wasn't that, that TBS team? Wasn't Johnny Morris related to Jeannie Morris? I don't know if there was a connection there or not. You're right, Scott. Good point there. Yes, they were married to each other. That's right. Johnny Morris used to do a lot of the Bears games for CBS. And he would get a lot of uh, sometimes Lions games too because they, you know, his location. He was housed in Chicago. But yeah, that was uh, that was Jeannie's husband. I don't know if they're still married. That I don't know. No, well, all right. I just saw the Chicago connection. And Phyllis George, Phyllis George, a former Miss America, and and tapped by CBS in a brilliant move. Brilliant move when they put that, like I said, that team together for the NFL today with Musburger, Jimmy the Greek, Irv Cross, and Phyllis. Yeah, Phyllis went on to be married to the governor, I believe, is it John? Yes, John Y. Brown, correct. So if I remember right. All right, we'll go a few more here, then we'll wrap up the broadcast. All right, Jamie Samuelson, Rick, you don't know me, say a longtime radio sports talk show in Detroit. We'll just like mention that Jamie, not getting any specifics on him. Yeah. There, Martin Capillion, longtime writer who covered the Detroit Red Wings, as well as other sports, one of the more versatile writers in the metro Detroit area. Ed Farmer, broadcaster, you talked about him. Ed Farmer, yeah. I've had a great career, uh, you know, uh, uh, White Sox announcer. And uh, sadly, he was he was uh, taken before his time, too, as well. Eddie Farmer. And he pitched for the Tigers at one time, too. I remember that. Okay, go from Ed Farmer to Roger Kahn, sports writer and author. Oh, Roger Kahn, yeah. He was an award-winning author. And, and uh, Roger was a great writer. He was a terrific writer. And uh, I, I think that Roger was the uh, um, uh, the guy that really put the 
put baseball on the map with that book called The Boys of Summer. Right. Just terrific, terrific writer and author of that book. Okay. And talk about Ashley Cooper, male tennis. Ashley Cooper was a very good tennis uh, player, uh, you know, and some people think Ashley was a girl. No, no, no. He was a men's tennis player right. and he went to many Grand Slam tournaments and he was from Australia. And you alluded to Phyllis George and one, I know you're not familiar with Rick, but uh, we grew up in Detroit, Larry Adderley. This one kind of shocked me a little bit. Did a lot of Detroit Red Wing stuff and was a very versatile broadcaster. I believe he appeared yeah. News too, if I remember he right. sure did, Scott. Scott, you know, he succeeded a legend in Channel 7, as you know, with Dave Dials when Dave yeah. Dials left and they promoted Larry Adderley to sports director. And uh, Al Ackerman eventually came over from Channel 4 to Channel 7 as well. But Larry Adderley did a lot for golf, especially the state of Michigan. Larry loved golf and he became the number one radio reporter on all the Michigan PGA and USGA events. And uh, like you said, Scott, he was uh, quite a broadcaster in his time in Detroit, did the Red Wings as well. And one I want to mention here locally in Southern Florida, his name is Bernie Rosen. He was a sports director, died at the age of 93 in the South Florida area. I had a good fortune of meeting Bernie Rosen at some Miami Dolphins games. So, you know, he, he has pretty good, interesting stories to share. He's been around it. And actually, Bernie Rosa worked with Mark Wilson. Wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark Wilson at Rick Curdy knows all too well. Yeah. We, we did a broadcast <laughs> with Rick and I and Mark, and that's, uh, yeah. you know, that's where uh, Bernie Rosen, that was his boss, and that's what helped Mark get Mark going until he subsequently moved to Detroit. So wow. I know for a lot of you folks that are probably wondering, I'm going to keep track of those names. Well, for one, get an open pad and a pencil and paper. Otherwise, you can watch his broadcast a lot. We know you'll be able to, if you find five or 10, 15 people out of this group, you've done really well. We've hit a lot of, we've hit on a lot of them, but that's just the story of 2020. It's amazing how many people, as Rick has alluded to, that we've really lost in one year. And this one just seems to be, you know, the magnitude of the losses just seem outrageous. The Hall of Famers, the coaches and whatnot. So to yeah. me, that's 2020 in a nutshell. All I can say for 2020 is good riddance. <laughs> I agree. I'll I second. can't wait. Ready for 2021. That's right. So, so all right, George, why don't you let everybody, uh, that concludes this edition of the sports sure. team. Before we get off the, the air, though, George, why don't you let everybody go ahead and promote uh, the book that you wrote about yeah. Yeah, I got Detroit sports broadcasters on the air featuring the likes of Ernie Harwell, Ray Lane, Van Patrick, Frank Beckman, uh, Bud Lynch and Bruce Martin and uh, Bob Reynolds. And, uh, and, and, you know, Van Patrick did the Lions games and uh, Scott is featured in the book, too. And uh, it's a great little book to have. It's uh, Detroit sports broadcasters on the air by Arcadia Press. And there's a link for you to purchase that on my profile page at the South Florida Tribune. You can also reach me at, um, at DSBA2 on uh, Twitter. And also um, I'm on Facebook, uh, George Eichhorn on Facebook. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Rick, go ahead. Uh, you can contact me on my website at www.charlottebats.com. My email address is cltbatsbaseballgmail.com. I'm also on Facebook at charlottemlb. And I'm also on Charlotte Bats Baseball. I'm also on Instagram at Charlotte Bats. Also on the Twitter at Charlotte Bats Baseball. And you can find me on LinkedIn under Rick Curti, C-U-R-T-I. All right. As for us, well, you want to follow us, South Florida Tribune, I'll give you lots of ways to do it. Okay. You go to Twitter at Tribune South. It's at Tribune South on Facebook and Instagram. You can like us and follow us there, South Florida Tribune. Yes, you definitely got that right. If you want to see the visual version of the broadcast, subscribe for nothing over at the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel, and then you'll get all the broadcasts that we have. Uh, you can uh, Our website is www.southfloridatribune.com. You can find all of our broadcasts there, all kinds of content from our media distribution partners, as well as our columnists, Motor City Monitors on there as well, but especially the broadcasts are definitely on there. So we definitely have uh, news, national news on there. It's a full-fledged site that my wife, Candy, does a wonderful job maintaining day in and day out. I, I've never seen a person 
uh, continue to maintain a website as well as she does. You know, so you've got that. And of course, you can email me at South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. You've got the website. If you want to go ahead and hear the audio version of this broadcast, you can do so at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or wherever you get your podcast. So, you know, Rick does a wonderful job with our social media department. I've enjoyed having you guys as co-hosts. I can see a lot of us doing some really good things next year. You know, again, we try to do everything that we can to put together this best possible shows. And, you know, I can't thank you guys enough for what you guys do on your time so that we can try to keep it real for everybody. I know, obviously, I'd like to get more enthusiastic, but the subject matter dictated the way we're going to approach tonight, knowing that this is our final show of 2020. We look forward to having a lot more fresh ideas going into 2021. So, Rick, once again, thank you for what you do with our social media department. We're forever grateful. So, you know, no problem. Uh, anything else you guys want to add? It's just no, been, uh, uh, I've enjoyed uh, 2020 uh, doing this show. It's been, a, like I said, a horrific year, but um, uh, what's been great is uh, doing the show with you, Scott, and and meeting uh, great, great people. And uh, I just thank you for having me on your program and uh, ready for 2021. We're glad to have you, George. I just want to wish everybody a very, very happy Kwanzaa and happy new year of 2021. It's going to be some great football action. I can't wait to Notre Dame and Alabama, especially. I want to see that game on New Year's Eve. And uh, the game, uh, the other game, well, Clemson's going to walk all over them. So uh, foot, watch your football on New Year's Day and New Year's Eve and uh, enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the holiday at home. Be safe. Well, Be safe. Next, and wear your mask. The next time I do this broadcast, it won't be at the age of 57. I can promise you that. So, uh, Happy birthday okay. to Scott Morgan Roth, the lead anchor and lead host of the Sports Exchange. Happy birthday, Scott. Hey, so we started out many years ago. George continues on. And yes. <laughs> there, so, but, all right, Rick, go ahead and give the COVID message. Nobody does it better than you. Well, you know, like I said, 2020 has been a long year, but, you know, it's going to get longer if people don't pay attention. And you guys need to wear a mask, please. Social distance, enough of these stupid parties and, and meeting your friends at bars and concerts. And, you know, you know, um, I know it sucks to stay at home. And but what also sucks is to die. You don't want to die from this, you know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, someone in my family, uh, my mom in, in New Mexico, someone in her family actually passed away from COVID. And um, it's not, it's awful. It's not a hoax. It's not the flu. It's not something that's going to disappear. We just need to be smart about this. Wear a mask, protect other people. Don't be selfish, you know, and. and... Well, okay. God, I think we lost Rick, but uh, thanks again for a great show, Scott. All right, no problem, George. Thank you very much as well. And, Mom, I love you very much. I'll miss you tomorrow, but you know what? You're definitely heavily in my mind and in my heart. So great job, George, and uh, we'll talk soon. God bless, George. Happy New Year. You too. Happy New Year, everybody.